Welcome, everyone. We are the Disciples of Yahweh, and this is Truth Seekers. Today, we have a special guest, as you can see. It's Brother Al Fadi. So, Jody, take it away. Wow, this, this has become a great friend over, over the last year or so, and I am really, really thankful to have Al Fadi. I mean, he's a great man of God. He knows his stuff. You know, we've had Jay Smith on, on our program before, but Jay Smith doesn't know the heart of the Muslim like Al Fadi does. He, he doesn't know how a Muslim thinks as good as Al Fadi does because Al Fadi came from a Muslim background. And, you know, Muslims, they shun, shun their uh, family members. They will actually execute you. The religion of peace will actually execute you if you decide to become a Christian. That don't sound like the religion of peace. And, you know, he's got such a great testimony. I'm sure he's not going to go into the detail, but look him up on his channel. Uh, he will have the link down below. Look him up. Support this man. Great man of God, because what he says is truth. I mean, you know, he has done such a mighty work of God. And let me introduce you to Brother Al Fadi. Well, Brother Jody, thank you so much. And uh, I just, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. And uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, the Lord is blessing us with platforms like this. And I'm thankful for the work you do. And just to clarify, yeah, I, I know what you meant by Jay doesn't have the heart of a Muslim. I think he, what you mean is he's not a Muslim background believer. Uh, right. At least people think that uh, Jay does not really care that much for them. He's invested uh, 30 years of his life serving them. But you're right. I mean, uh, no matter how long you live in a certain area, unless you belong to that people, that people grew, you know, their culture, their language, uh, their ethnicity, you've been one of them, it will be difficult for you to, let's say, think like them, articulate things like them, or even in our case, since we're talking about Muslims, even appreciate where they're coming from. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, when a Muslim tells me something, as you probably have heard before, like the Bible is corrupt, or Jesus never said that I am God, worship me, or uh, you know, the crucifixion never took place. I mean, we have to sympathize with that because they're really relating to you what they have learned. I mean, that's all. They're not making up these stories. That's what they were told. That's what they learned. That's what I learned before coming to Christ. So, uh, you know, I'm thankful that at least they're honest about, uh, you know, how they feel. But my prayer is that they will be open-minded uh, to listen to the counter argument. And, and that's where you run into those who are willing and those who are not. And these, this is why we're blessed to have platforms like this, like yours, like mine, like Dr. Jay Smith and others, Sister Hatoon, you know, Brother Anthony Rogers and all of those, David Wood, you know, Sam Shimon. Uh, the reason is people will go and search. And the hope is that when they search, uh, you know, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit will draw them to the truth. So uh, again, uh, I am thankful uh, to be here. Like you said, people can always go and watch my testimony, whether in my channel or anywhere. They just Google al Fadi testimony. I'm sure they'll be able to come across that. Just for the interest of time, brother, I want to focus on serving you here today. So thank you again. Well, I want to remind well, people how our channel got a big boost from al Fadi when Jody appeared on his show. And you can still watch that video where uh, Jody went on uh, Al Fadi's show when we were just starting out, helped us to get over 100 subscribers, and now we're closing in on 1,000. So we thought it'd be appropriate to have Al Fadi on our show this time right. as we close in on this new milestone. All right. So today we're, we're, we're going to talk about what, Jody? Well, uh, please subscribe to our channel, Disciples of YHWH in Christ. Um, Please subscribe to our channel. If you hadn't already subscribed to Al Fadi's channel, subscribe to that as well. But how about the Quran? It seems like that's the book. And why, why when you, you started to see that the Quran was wrong, how did that develop that you seen that they were possibly errors? Or how did you recognize that the Quran was possibly corrupt or how did you realize that, Al? 
Well, for, certainly, I mean, when I was searching the truth, um, I, let me back up for a second. First, congratulations, of course, on reaching a, a thousand. And I want to encourage those who are watching to really subscribe. Not everybody watches usually a subscriber. And I pray that you will hit the 10,000 mark uh, also. Uh, it's it's going to be slow at the beginning, brother. I mean, it took me, uh, gosh, since 2016. But once you hit the 10,000, the 20,000 becomes easier. And then the 50,000 becomes easier. So that's our prayer. Be patient. It's good that you're building it organically speaking. So uh, for me, uh, I mean, again, I want to uh, say not all Muslims come to Christ because they um, discover that there is something wrong with the Quran. To me, it was at least what the Quran was relating message wise about Jesus did not line up with what the Bible was saying. So it was the content itself. Obviously, uh, for the last couple of years, I've invested a lot of time, whether alone in my own research or with the likes of Dr. J. Smith and others to also examine the evidence about the book called the Quran, its genesis, um, its transmission, uh, its development, and the list can go on and on and on. And yes, uh, there is a lot of troubling things in there. And the reason why I want to bring it up usually to the forefront in our shows is that I know how Muslims think about the Quran. A Muslim uh, would honestly tell you the Quran is the only preserved book revealed by God, who is the same God, by the way, in their mind, who also revealed the Torah, who also revealed the Injil, which there is a debate. If we're saying Torah, are we talking the books of Moses or are we talking the Old Testament in general? If we're saying the Injil, are we talking about the four Gospels or are we talking about the New Testament in general? But all that to say, somehow, amazingly, the same God that revealed these books to Moses, to Jesus, and to others, by the way, there are books that were revealed allegedly, uh, or Sohof, if you wish, uh, were revealed to Abraham, which we don't have access to that, and, and the likes. Somehow he allowed these books to become corrupt. The message is not authentic anymore. Uh, allowed a uh, normal human being like you and I to intervene and change the content. But it's the same God allegedly, who is preserving this book called the Quran perfectly since the day of its inception. In fact, a Muslim can take you all the way back to before even creation. God had the Quran in what we call the preserved tablets. And all the messages that were revealed in the past, kind of like flavors of that. But then the Quran came as the final conclusion to God's message, a universal message to mankind. So that's puzzling when you think of it from a rational standpoint, from an academic standpoint, because you begin to look at early Quranic manuscripts just on the surface alone. There are variants that you find in there. And we're not talking variants between, uh, you know, like the canonical variants or the canonical readings. No, you find variants even uh, that do not line up with the so-called the seven readings of the Quran that were canonized back in the 10th century by Ibn Mujahid, or the 1924 Cairo edition that is considered to be the Hafs narration, and it is one of the most popular Qurans today. So you look at the manuscripts and you see evidence of differences. Another thing, you look at the manuscripts and you see evidence of pronunciation could differ because the early Quranic manuscripts, as you uh, folks know, did not have what we call diacritical markings, did not have dottings. Why is that crucial for a language like Arabic? Well, it is crucial because once you put these dottings and also the diacritical markings, the vowel markings, you begin to know how to pronounce something accurately. And when you pronounce it accurately, you are going now to relate an accurate message and sometimes the same word, just the same structure of that word, we call it rasm. Uh, if you put the dottings in the wrong place, you can come up with a different meaning. And there are instances in the Quran where when you do that, the entire verse meaning can change. I mean, I have a gentleman the other day uh, on my show. He's a Messianic Jew who really made a convincing argument to me before and to Jay, and I think Jay had that particular segment on one of the shows he did with him, that 
some of the readings at the Dome of the Rock, if you really look at it from a different way to pronounce it grammatically, you can get a different message. You can, can entirely get a different message. And, and he ab absolutely did a convincing you know, argument uh, that even I was baffled by it, but I could not really refute it because he made a good case for it. Now, whether that's an accurate way to read it or not, it's up for debate. But what I'm saying is you can see the dilemma that our Muslim friends have. When you look at the early Quranic manuscripts, just the way they are, it's up for grab. That's if you know how to read them, by the way. Not every Muslim can read it. Not, you have to be a scholar in the field. It's taken me years to learn how to read them, to learn how to articulate what I'm seeing. And that's just, you know, among the first steps. And now you begin to look at evidence of variations. I want to call them variations because I want to be careful. And I want to be respectful to our Muslim friends. Uh, at least they think I'm trying to mock or uh, ridicule something. So that's one thing. Another thing we know today because of the work of the likes of Dr. Uh, Daniel Brubaker, and we're thankful for his work, he also uncovered corrections that were made to these early manuscripts. Now there are a couple of ways to look at those corruption. Uh, I mean, uh, you can call them corruption. Technically speaking, a corruption is a change of something. Uh, you know, we're not saying it in a derogatory word, but all that to say, there are a couple of ways to look at these corrections. Now, Dr. Brubaker's theory, uh, and I really appreciate it, is that those corrections were made at a later time, meaning it would have been years and decades and maybe hundreds of years later, to try to standardize certain readings to match what we have in our hand today, the 1926 Quran. In other words, you have a book that was published in 1924, allegedly represents the genesis of the Quran 14 centuries later. So if you're reading the 1924 edition, it's almost like you're reading what the Prophet of Islam received 14 centuries later. You, you see the dichotomy and the problem we're having here? How can you, 14 centuries later, tell me that you know what was revealed to this Prophet? That's number one. Number two, this reading that we call the 1924 Cairo edition is based on one of these seven canonicals readings called, known as the Hafs reading. And Dr. Brubaker's theory is that once the Hafs reading became more popular, somehow people who are in charge of these you know, manuscripts, maybe certain uh, uh, manuscripts, wanted to make some corrections to make sure that the words jive with that. Now, did they do it because they thought what was there was wrong? Probably not. They just thought maybe this is the ac accurate way to read it. Or we want to make sure there are no contradictions that will cause confusion. I mean, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't want to accuse them of doing it in a malicious way. But what I'm saying is, once you correct something, that tells me there was something there that you did not like or something that does not jive with what you have in your hand today. If you give me a letter today and I give it back to you and I have fixed few words, you're going to look at it and say, oh, so you didn't like what I said and you <laughs> made corrections to it. Even if it was the same word, I just made it maybe formal versus you were using an informal way of saying the same word. So our Muslim friends have a problem. There is variations. There are corrections. And the list can go on and on. Just these two alone tell you that there is no way this book that they claim to be the Quran is a preserved book or let, let me add, perfectly preserved book. So I'll stop here in case you have any questions because I want to add to this. Yeah, there's something I want to ask about what you just said, that there were corrections that make the manuscripts look more like the 1924 Cairo edition. So were those uh, corrections made after 1924? Can, can we know that for sure or, or what? That's an excellent question. And this is, of course, the dilemma that any scholar will face. And I tell you, Dr. Brubaker also would welcome, of course, any refutation of that. That's why it's a theory. It's a thesis, mm -hmm. if you wish. Um, Dating a manuscript is easier than dating the ink itself. Now, if we can date the ink, we'll be able to tell this ink was 
20 years ago or 100 years ago. Uh, but, but the idea that the, the Dr. Brubaker's observation is, is really fabulous when he noticed that amazingly, most of these, I, I don't want to say all because I, I, he's still working on things and I, wanna, I don't want to jump ahead of him. Most of these corrections, he discovered that somehow line up with the what we call the 1924 edition. So it's no coincidence then that one can argue that they would have been done either at the same time or a later time, meaning after the publication of the 1924. But the Huff's reading had been around, by the way, for a while, and it gained its popularity towards the end of the 18th, 19th century but it became the most popular one once the 1924 edition was published. So that's one theory. Others will say, no, 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 it has nothing to do with Hafsa, just a coincidence, but it was done later, I mean earlier, meaning maybe a 50 year here, 100 years there, 200 years here, when someone discovered a mistake, they went ahead and corrected it. Even that explanation, it shows me that there is a problem with the uh, you know, claim that the Quran has been preserved. Uh, and who, Jody, who would have the authority to to, yeah. to make the correction? Who is the prophet? If that, that, that's that's what that's what I get to right now. Exactly. Okay. I'm sorry, Jody. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I was just curious. When you as a devout Muslim, did you ever see any of these variances? And how many true Muslims have seen these variances now? In my days. And there's a lot of Muslims that lived uh, in those days. We did not have the ample evidence that a lot of our young generation now Muslims have. We did not have YouTube. We did not have the Google. And even if you wanted to look at a manuscript, let's say I did go to a, a look at a manuscript and I saw a correction, I doubt I would have claimed that there was a corruption taking place. They would have explained it to me in a way that I would have accepted and that's it. There is no question of authority. So... My days were totally different. To answer your question, no, I did not know about these uh, unorthodox corrections. Did I know about variant text readings and how to read the Quran in different ways? Yes, I knew about that. You study this. So that, that wasn't an issue of question. Even that, you don't dare to even question the rationale behind it. How can I read the Quran in seven different ways? So which way was it preserved in heaven? Which way was it revealed? You see, you don't ask these kind of uh, at least logical questions until later by the power of the Holy Spirit. You begin to look back at it and say, wait a minute. I mean, this alone should be a cause for me to pause and wonder, how is it that the Quran was revealed in seven different ways, yet the Quran is silent on that? And then it wasn't until a Hadith tradition somehow emerged that was used by a gentleman of the name Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid in the 10th century who claimed that he knew which seven will reveal to the prophet. Wow, that is amazing, you know? So who decided these seven readings? A man by the name of ibn Mujahid. Who decided which Quran was the authentic Quran Earlier, 300 years earlier, a man by the name of the Caliph Uthman ibn Affan. He's the one, if you remember the story, who allegedly burned all other competing copies and only established a one authentic recension known as the Uthmanic Resum or the Uthmanic Edition. Out of this now, everybody tried to compare. The 1924 Hafs reading, they say it matches the Uthmanic recension. Ibn Mujahid says it also jives with the Uthmanic Resim. And once you start adding the dots, amazingly and miraculously, you seven different ways of reading this Quran emerges. So you have a man by the name of uh, Ibn Uthman, I'm sorry, Uthman Ibn Affan decided this. Ibn Mujahid decided this. And then a committee of human beings like you and I in 1924 also decided this. Do you, do you see the human factor involved here in trumping the authority of God in this case. Right. It should only be the God's prophet who can give you the authentic revelation. But, but even that's, that's questionable. You know, it seems to me that uh, Islam is a historical religion, but Muslims don't actually study the history of their own religion, including the genesis of the Quran. How, how is, I mean, tell us, what were you taught? What do you think is the mindset there? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Now that this takes, takes us to another problem, which is the uh, historical criticism of the origin of Islam itself. I don't know if you've been watching 
the number oh. of shows that Dr. Jay Smith have been doing, and then he and I together, and now I have a couple of uh, others who are the myth sifters, if you wish, <laughs> uh, that we've been bringing on, like uh, you know Mel and others as well. All, sorry, all of that to say uh, that those particular uh, uh, you know uh, stories that I studied growing up. When Islam was started, in which year the prophet became a prophet? When did he receive the Quran? When did he migrate? Uh, when did he die? When the Quran for the first time was collected during the reign of Abu Bakr? When the Quran was also uh, standardized during the reign of Uthman? All of these are based on now we, we can claim historical documents that were written at a later time. I don't want to even use the word fabricated. I mean, it was written at a later time. The gap usually is between 70 to 200 years. No eyewitness account. So how in the world can you decide what the prophet says, like the hadith, for instance, or what he did, like in the biography, or what was revealed to him, like in the case of the Quran, if you weren't there and you don't even have eyewitness account to try to justify that, and this is why Muslims will uh, emphasize the idea of the chain of narrations, the isnad, but even that is questionable. Even that is questionable. Yeah, the, uh, Jody, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I was just curious, um, the, you know, to talk about the prophet of Muhammad. Did you ever, or, you know, it would seem to me it would even be disturbing for the average Muslim. You know, he married, you know, this is not a, it don't seem like it's hidden. Most Muslims know this. You know, he was married to a six-year-old and then he consummated the marriage at nine years old. Do they, how, do, how, how did you deal with that as a Muslim and how do you, you know, show this? Again, brother, you accept it at face value. And you do not question it because questioning the authority of the prophet is really a huge problem for you if you dare to do so. So it's always accepted. There is always explanations as to why this happened. Among those is that he's the prophet and he has special privileges. Another explanation is that God chose a young wife for him. So after he's passing, uh, passes away, his young uh, prophet, uh, his young uh, uh, wife, I should say, can relate to the next generation the things that she learned from him for a longer time because she was young. So there is always explanations as to why this happened. And no one, no Muslim really uh, uh, in the right mind will dare to question it. Even if they do, they might think of it privately because of what's happening today. Just in the last 20 years, satellite programming and internet and the YouTube and social media have definitely unlocked a treasure trove of these kind of information. But even with that, I guarantee you not all Muslims will dare to question it publicly out of fear of retaliation and isolation and so on and so forth. Do you think we'll see a church in Saudi Arabia in our lifetime? We will see a church in Saudi Arabia. We may see even a complex of churches, different denominations, but that does not mean we're going to see a Saudi church, if that's what you're asking about. Right. No, that, uh, I mean, um, God is able to do miraculous things. I am so thankful, of course, that the uh, um, crown prince is, is very open-minded, that he is allowing a lot of changes to take place. There is modernization, including intellectual modernization. And, uh, you know, we have to take it uh, step by step. Uh, God who made the Saudis loves the Saudis and cares for the Saudis. And in his perfect timing, uh, things like this will happen. To be honest with you, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think it's better for the church to always be persecuted because it will <laughs> flourish that way rather than to get comfortable. Right. This is just my observation. Right. Yeah, we, um, we... I want to explain something about the thumbnail for this video. It has a picture of a church in Saudi Arabia uh, near the town of Jubail, which is a fourth century church. Fourth century. That means before Islam was on the Arabian Peninsula, Christianity was there, also Judaism. But so the, the gospel had penetrated that peninsula, the Ar Arabia, before 
uh, Islam came on the scene. So it's time to win back the, uh, the, the continent of Arabia and the Arab people back to Christ. And as, this is why it's so great to have Al-Fani and, and uh, other people who, you know, are Arabians. I don't know any other, <laughs> but we want to, uh, you know, not only pull down Islam, but build up the church in Saudi Arabia. So that's, a, you know, I was so surprised when I learned that I'd taken my uh, a class on Islam in seminary, that the Christianity and Judaism were there long before Islam. And so I, I thought that would be an appropriate thing to put up with, uh, with Brother Al Fadi being on the show. Go ahead, Jody. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, what is some techniques that Christians can use uh, would you go with the historical problems, the, uh, you know, the manuscript problems or the culture problems? Or how would, you know, if you had five, ten minutes to be with a Muslim, what topics would you bring up? Yeah, uh, five, ten minutes. Uh, the only topic you can bring up is the gospel and salvation. That's, that's all you can do uh, because you do not want to waste the time talking about issues like this especially if you're not familiar even with those. So I would say, even if you have years uh, to spend with them, always keep it focused on sin, salvation, and the need for Christ. Mm -hmm. Along the way, if you know something about their culture, then ask questions about it. If you don't, and you notice something about the culture, go ahead and ask clarifying questions. They enjoy the fact that you're paying attention and you wanna learn. Nothing wrong with that. But once a Muslim, becomes more of a seeker, if you wish. The topics of the Quran and uh, Muhammad and his character and uh, God and the Trinity and all that kind of stuff uh, will, will come to the front, uh, um, basically the forefront of this discussion. And only when you are friends with them, when you know they're seeking, it will be appropriate for you now to pinpoint issues with the Quran, pinpoint issues with the history, of Islam, pinpoint issues with the character of Muhammad because they're more forgiven and more accepting of that. Mm -hmm. Other than that, if you if you start with that uh, basically direction, you're going to burn a lot of bridges so fast that the relationship will not really mature, and you don't want that to happen. And like I said, focusing on sin, focusing on salvation can open a lot of doors for you and them because they're going to come at it from the work based system. You are going to show the need for Jesus. They're going to hear things they're not familiar with. You're going to hear things that you did not know they think about. And the prompting of the Holy Spirit will guide and direct that discussion. And hopefully, like I said, I mean, now these days, they know about many of these issues you raised, the historical problem, the textual problem. They're not naive. They, they hear about it. They come across it. But whether they're buying it or not, that's a whole different story. And yes, there is a time for it to be discussed. I want to go back to the the origin of the Quran. Since you, we were talking about the Quran and and uh, the manuscripts and all that, let's start with the origin story. And, and it seems to me that so much of what the story that we get out of the Hadith and even the Sira literature is kind of fishy. Uh, you know, we got this guy who doesn't know how to read and write, and God has given him a revelation that he wants written down. You got this guy who's all alone in a cave, whereas our God, I mean, the true God, said. He wants everything to be established by two or three witnesses. But we got this guy off by himself. Uh, he wants to kill himself after he's seen the angel. There's, there's a lot of troubling things in that origin story. Did, did it ever trouble you as a Muslim? Did they not know this or just did they just accept it because we don't ask questions? No, no. We know about this. We know the fact that he was in a cave by himself, that an angel appeared to him. That's the claim that he was squeezed by this angel multiple times that he received a message that we know is the Genesis of the Quran, chapter 96, verses 1 to 3, at least, if not the entire chapter. And then we know that he was disturbed by the fact that the revelation stopped and he wanted to commit suicide. Now, we looked at it as, wow, look how much he loved God and he wanted to serve him, that he was disturbed by the fact that the message wasn't being received. You see, that's yeah. how you process it. Right. I don't question it. I just process it this way and life goes on. Now, today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you look back and you say, wait a minute. You know, how do I know he was in a cave in the first place? 
Well, who are his witnesses? Look at the warning in the Bible by the Apostle Paul about even if an angel appears to you and shares with you a message different than what we are sharing, you know, may this angel be eternally damned, a curse. See, now you understand it from the biblical standpoint, from the spiritual standpoint, from the God who is the God of truth. His word is truth. He is the source of truth. So, uh, you know, a natural man cannot understand what the spiritual man can understand. And, and that's where, uh, they, you know, basically the, our Muslim friends are usually. They're at the natural level. And the more they seek and the more they get convicted by the Holy Spirit, that's what unlocks this truth to them. And many come to Christ and they begin to question the things that you just mentioned. Right. So, so what about the historical origin of the Quran? What evidence is there and when does it begin to appear? The only, I mean, I'm going to share with you the standard Islamic narrative. That's why we call it Sin, S-I-N. I mean, not, not, I'm not the guy who came up with the title, uh, with the acronym, but I mean, that's why we use this, I should say, in our shows. The standard Islamic narrative says that after the death of the prophet in the year 632 AD, that um, there was a group of Arabs who reverted back to idolatry known as apostates. And the first caliph, Uthman, uh, Abu Bakr, I should say, uh, was disturbed by that and wanted to, by force, you know, either bring him back or at least kill them for their, you know, basically being traitors. As this was unfolding, the story says that Omar, who was the second caliph, was also worried about the Quran being lost because he says many of the memorizers of the Quran ended up dying. Now, when you go back to read the history, it was about 70. My goodness, the whole Quran that people believe in was memorized by 70 people, or at least the majority uh, of them were among the 70s. I mean, that, that alone is a, is a cause for worry. But in his mind, the memorizers of the Quran are being uh, uh, killed and are dying during this battle of Yamama is known. So he advised this caliph Abu Bakr to consider writing the Quran for the first time in a codex format rather than to preserve it in memory. And the story tells you that Abu Bakr was disturbed by this. And then, uh, uh, you know, he actually accepted this. And then they invited someone by the name of Zaid. And Zaid was also disturbed by the fact that the prophet never asked him or anyone to write it down. Why would he do something that the prophet himself did not sanction during his days? And finally, he was convinced and he formed a committee and collected the Quran. OK, so what happened to this copy? Well, the copy was known as the Hafs, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Hafsa Quran, not Hafs, Hafsa, uh, who happens to be one of the wives of Muhammad and the daughter of Omar, the daughter of Omar. She somehow... I mean, uh, they, you, you can argue why uh, there are so many reasons. Ended up with this copy, the standard written copy, and she kept it with her. In fact, some traditionals say she kept it under her bed, actually. And it stayed like this until 20 years later. Uthman was expanding the territories of Islam up north in what we call modern-day Levant, modern-day Iraq, modern-day Turkey. And he began to receive reports back from his commanders telling him that some of our soldiers are fighting among each other. They're having, uh, there, is, uh, there is a strife between them on the pronunciation and the reading of some of the passages of the Quran. The people from Iraq will read certain things different than the people from Levant and the people from other areas. So he advised Uthman to do something about this. So Uthman says, okay, we're going to invite Zaid again. And Zaid is going to form a committee again. And Zaid is going to put the Quran also in writing again, except this time, whenever there is a disagreement, they're going to use the Qurayshi dialect, our dialect. And we are going to take these competing copies and we're going to burn these competing copies. And therefore, we end up with one standard copy, make copies out of this one and disseminate it to the regions under our control. Right there, we have a dilemma because it says he disseminated four copies. Some will say four plus one he kept with him. Some will say seven, and some will say nine. Well, I don't know which tradition is correct, but anyway, 
All that to say is that's what the story of the co compilation and the dissemination of the Quran would look like. Well, long and behold, 300 years later, the man by the name of Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid discovered that even though Uthman went through this pain, uh, you know, process of collecting one copy with a certain dialect as the standard and burning everything else, he discovered that there is so many readings, some will say it was north of 50 ways of reading the Quran, ended up on choosing seven of those. How in the world did he decide that these sevens were the ones that were revealed to Muhammad? Nobody knows. Even his contemporaries were disturbed, by the way. Some of them were challenging that, and he used his authority, exerted it on them. Some were imprisoned as a result of this, some flogged, and, and all that kind of stuff. So he chose these seven based on their popularity, based on their influence, and based on how vast their readings have spread. So there is no logic to it in the first place except just popularity. So if you have 1,000 subscribers, brother, you are more popular than someone who has 50 subscribers. So there you go. I'm going to choose you because of your popularity now, not because of anything kosher you're teaching. I mean, that's the argument. That's the logic. And then someone came later. I mean, someone in the 15th century added four more readings. This is, oh, Ibn Mujahid missed these four also. Uh, uh, I should say there were three that were added immediately after that, making it 10. And then another person came in the Jazari and added four more. So now we have what we call the 14 canonical readings. Well, the Quran is silent on these things. The Quran never talked about this. The Quran never even mentioned two readings, not to mention seven or 10 or 14. But this is what the standard Islamic narrative is all about. Coupled by the hadith, which you have to go to the hadith like you stated correctly, to learn about some of these stories. Like Bukhari, for instance, mentioned these stories that I just shared with you. The biography of the Prophet will talk about how he was receiving uh, basically the Quran and so on and so forth. So this is what the traditional story will tell you. Today, I can tell you the traditional story lacks eyewitness account lacks manuscript evidence, lack archaeological evidence to back it up, and the list can go on and on and on. So that was the that was the story, the standard narrative. What is the historical evidence suggest? Well, the historical evidence meaning that you have to look at where the evidence lead. And how, how do you know where the evidence lead? You look at discoveries, whether it's manuscripts, whether it's archaeological uh, evidence. And this is where we're starting to unearth a number of contradictions, discrepancies. So the Quran, for instance, we know that there are evidence of corrections, variations. Okay, well, even if Uthman did the standardization, we do know that there are other readings out there, for instance, that differ from that. So you said he burned everything. Well, obviously he did not burn everything. And those ones that we're discovering that contradict the standard reading, were they original? Were they fabrications? Were they earlier than Uthman? Were they during the time of Uthman? Were they after the time of Uthman? If they're earlier than Uthman, then you wonder why didn't Uthman choose some of these readings? If they're after the time of Uthman, you wonder, my goodness, where did they get this reading from? Was it still preserved in memory, for instance? It appears that there is no standard approach yet. What about any archeological evidence to back up the idea uh, that Mecca existed at a certain time? Uh, or uh, there was a writing of the Quran that started at a certain time. There are all kind of issues with the dating. And, um, you know, leave it like that. Just um, it's, it's very hard for any scholar, by the way, any decent, honest scholar will tell you, um, unless you have tangible evidence that you can date to specific er uh, dates, uh, there are usually ranges. If you look at manuscripts, by the way, they'll tell you it's dated between this date and this date. They try to be at least fair. They don't want to pinpoint a specific time. And here is where we have a problem. For instance, you have something like the Birmingham folios. The range of dates in one, one instance was even before Muhammad was in the scene. And another time it was before and after he was. So, so how do you how do you wrestle with these things? How do you rationalize these things? I mean, so that's, that's what I mean, that there are gaps 
in this particular theory. But then you begin to discover more tangible evidence at a later time, like the coins, you know, for instance, or actual archaeological discoveries or writings that point to something that might have emerged or standardized at a much later time than the standard Islamic narrative itself. What what do we currently uh, know that we didn't know like two or three years ago about Islam that, you know, they're just unearthing it. I, you know, Jay mentioned that they were a lot of people in Europe. They had all this knowledge about the Quran and Islam, but they wouldn't produce it because of fear of death and stuff like that. What are we now discovering about Islam that we didn't know just several years ago? Well, I mean, uh, Jody, I want to be fair to these scholars. I mean, they invest a lot of their energy in research and finding things. And to their credit, they publish these things also. Uh, so it's not their fault that no one discovered it. But no one dares at least to either at their level or those who are their students, for instance, or those who are doing research to come forward and say, OK, well, here's what's going on. Uh, like you mentioned, there is this fear of Islamophobia, you know, fear of retaliated against, fear of so many things. And back then, we didn't have the platforms that we have today. So you got to give them credit for being careful. I mean, you do not want to really expose yourself for no reason. But at the same time, uh, they're not coming to us now and saying, oh, I don't want you to publish this or say anything. I mean, they tell us. When we wrote it, we did not write it for an apologetic purposes. We're writing it for a historical, uh, basically, reasons. You use it apologetically. That's your role. That's your, basically, calling. But I'm not here to endorse it as apologetic. I mean, some of them will tell you something like this. And I appreciate that. I mean, again, once it's published, it's game. You know, uh, what can we make out of the data now that we find there? And you have now to begin to make some logical and rational explanations of it. Um, to follow up on, on what Jody was just saying, yes, this, the academics have been investigating and all these things, but Hatun tells about how she went into a store and asked for a Quran in North Africa. And they said, do you want a Wadish or a, a, a Hafs? Which one do you want? Which Quran? So there were Muslims who knew this, or at least people in North Africa. Why aren't they publishing their history? Why aren't they studying their own history? Well, I mean, again, uh, remember uh, in her story, she's talking just about uh, discovered Warsh, Hafs. Those are canonical readings. So uh, those who are selling it, they're not looking at it as a different Quran. They're just looking at a different variant text reading. It was through that that the Lord led her to begin to unearth other types of readings, other unknown readings, and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. Okay, so so the, we've talked about origins of the Quran, variants in, in the Quran. H how does this uh, data that, about variants and, and variant readings, um, all the, the 2730 Qurans, how does that impact Muslims? According to their worldview, what are they going to see or what are they going to think when they hear this? Well, uh, my hope is this, um, especially to our, you know, social media age Muslims, the ones that are watching YouTube videos, whether it's my YouTube video, this show, or Jay Smith, you know, or who knows, uh, that they will be honest with themselves and uh, just go and investigate. Again, in, in, in all of our shows, I mean, to my knowledge, we do not overlook providing evidence or sources for these things. We mention the name of the scholar who, for instance, talk about something like that, or we uh, give references to some of the material that anyone can benefit from. So I would ask him, go and investigate it. I mean, don't take my word for it. I mean, that's fine. You don't want to believe me? Fine. I'm, I'm not going to have my feelings hurt. But I want you to go and investigate and inspect it for yourself. When you see images of manuscripts that have corrections and you claim somehow that Dr. Brubaker did that for publicity, my goodness, how in the world Dr. Brubaker will do such a foolish thing, I mean, and risk his life just for the sake of publicity? What publicity is he looking for? Again, he's giving you the museum name. He's giving you where he found it. Go and see it for yourself. You don't have to wait for Dr. Brubaker. Because some of it are Islamic museums, by the way. We're not talking just the British Library. 
there is in Kuwait and in, in the United Arab Emirates and some in Uzbekistan and other areas. And go for yourself. See it for yourself. Don't don't uh, accuse Dr. Brobaker of doing something like that. The Turkish, you know, authority, they have their own work in there and they do a fine job, by the way, of doing this. Everything is available. I mean, people can go and get it for themselves. So that's my advice to them. Instead of getting emotional about the argument, ask yourself this. What if this is true? Where does that leave me now in terms of my faith that is standing on sandy foundation versus rock foundation? What will happen to me now that I've been exposed to this if I reject it, deny it, and die in this state? Where is my eternal abode is going to be? So, I mean, we're talking about eternal salvation here, eternal life. And therefore, a Muslim person should look at this from this vernacular eternal life, eternal damnation, and what's going to happen to me, not on this earth, but in the age to come. And that's really our hope here, that they would view it this way. Right. I, I've talked to many Muslims, and that would be a scary topic for me, that even Muhammad didn't know whether he was going to go to heaven. I mean, how can you be the greatest prophet of all time, you know, according to Islam, but yet he didn't know whether he was going to go to heaven. And you mentioned eternal life. Um, you know, what is it? You have to be martyred to guarantee you eternal life in Islam. Any other way is you're good versus you're bad. And, you know, if you go to Mecca certain many times, you know, then you, you get at it more good. You pray certain times more good. Or if you do something wicked, but, you know, that's the thing I love about Christianity. We have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And, and I can't imagine, maybe you can speak on the fear that Muslims have when they know they're not doing good enough. Of course. Uh, again, I want to be fair. Um, no Muslim will ever come to you saying they know that they're making it to heaven. I mean, they, they, they will never say something like this. But you're right, that prompt him to always try to follow the best model, and the best model given to them is the prophet. And the Quran teaches uh, things that in their mind, he's the only one who was able to fulfill it. It's almost like Jesus is the only one fulfilling the law. In their mind, Muhammad is the only one who was able to fulfill the law of the Quran. So they would follow his example. Uh, even if you pinpoint things that are troubling to you, they will say, well, you know what? God is pleased with him. Uh, it's not for me to sit down and question uh, how he did and what he did and why he did uh, certain things. So, uh, and, and of course, they're always striving to build as many good deeds as possible, as many good deeds that would be accepted by God, because they don't know if even the good deeds they're accumulating will be acceptable to God. Uh, you only hope for the best when you meet with God on judgment day and uh, wait for his final judgment and final conclusion. Wow. All right, so you've shown us uh, a lot of the problems with the Quran and its origin and its transmission and all that. Now, I, Muslims I've talked to, I get the impression they think the same is true of the Bible. It's been translated and, and copied and, and you know, uh, altered by men. How would you answer that uh, objection from a Muslim? You mean attacking our Bible? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly... There are so many ways you can respond to it, but the first and easiest one is to ask him where did their Quran state what they just said? Because I know where they're going to go. They're going to go to three or four verses that talk about a group of people, most of the time it's Jews, that somehow manipulated the word of Allah verbally. I would say, okay, so, so that doesn't say all the Jews, that doesn't say all the Christians, that doesn't say all of the Bible. So please show me evidence from your Quran that your God believes in what you just said. Number two, how hard is it to show me evidence from manuscripts? Show me a manuscript evidence that just uh, you know confirmed what you just said. Show me a single gospel that contradicts what I'm teaching. Show me a single teaching that contradicts the fact that we are saved by faith. By grace, for instance, show me. I mean, uh, it's not that difficult. Uh, my goodness, the Bible been scrutinized for ages by many people, believers and non-believers. And I'm not finding a single evidence that someone uh, reached the conclusion that you just reached. So it's just simple questions like this. I mean, if, if you're accusing me 
the onus of proof is on you. You're going to have to come up with the evidence. Now, I don't have anything to worry about. I mean, I'm not concerned for what you just said, simply because I have trust and confidence in my faith in this book, for instance. You're the one who said my book is uh, not good. Fine. Give me the evidence. I'll be more than happy to examine the evidence. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I was wanting to speak. I remember hearing your uh, testimony and the people who originally uh, you came to America to be with them. And, and I think you said that you didn't have a lot of conversations with them about Christianity, but you knew they were Christians and they didn't realize until many, many years later that you had became a Christian. Could you Talk about, you know, not giving up on your Muslim friends, not giving up, you know, the truth and, you know, staying in this field that seems very difficult. Could you speak on that? Because if if they hadn't have, you know, been, you know, there for you to allow you to come to America to visit America, then maybe you wouldn't be a Christian right now. That, that's true. I mean, I did not, by the way, come to visit anyone. I, I later needed assistant with uh conversations. And that's how the Lord opened the door for me to connect with this couple and discovered later that they were born again, which I didn't know what that meant. But initially out of fear of missing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the point as I'm conversing with them, I stayed in the law, um, you know, basically side of things. They will ask me, I'll answer things. And I wanted to just inquisitively find out from them also about their belief. But the intent at that moment wasn't really for me to go for the jugular, if you wish, because I'm still concerned about my ability to communicate. But then I, I moved on from that area to another area, severed my relationship with them just because I did not reconnect, not because they did something wrong. And it took 12 years later for me to come to Christ. And I began to look for this family and I did not find them for 10 more years. 22 years have passed and they finally uh, discovered when I connected with them that I became a believer. So God basically used this couple to uh, open my eyes to the truth, but others also came along the way and more seeds were added, more seeds were watered, but it was the Holy Spirit, obviously, that uh, finally brought me uh, to my knees to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So the moral story is that people at all walks of life uh, if they're believers, they can witness to anyone. God can still use their witness, whether it's simple, whether it's complex, whatever the Lord gives you ability to do, to share, to uh, uh, be inquisitive about my faith, to try to plant seeds, to try to uh, correct my misunderstandings. God is not going to let that go to waste. I mean, it's even if I appear to you that I'm rejecting what you're saying, that doesn't mean I'm not impacted by what I'm saying. Like that, uh, in my case, uh, I was... Um, basically uh, holding back my thoughts, holding back my doubts. But I was wrestling with these emotions based on what I'm hearing from them and from others later. And God, of course, brought all of that to fruition at the right time. So, so that's really what I wanted to, to share with everyone, that uh, trust in the Lord and uh, lean not on your own understanding, you know, and uh, uh, just trust in him and he will make your path straight. And in this case, he definitely showed me the straight path because of the faithfulness of this couple. Man, praise God for that couple. Uh, we rejoice yeah. for them. And, you know, I, I go looking at other testimonies, a guy that I don't even remember their name actually influenced David Wood to become a Christian, but yet I don't even remember his name. It doesn't matter where you're at in the picture. You know, maybe you'll be a nobody for the rest of your life, but that nobody who we don't even remember their name actually helped win David Wood to Christ. And we could go countless people like that who never gave up on that person. And then that person became a great, powerful man of God, just like you have yourself. I mean, you've won countless of Muslims to Christ. So we, we really appreciate your work. We really appreciate your ministry. Thank you, brother. I mean, I'm, I'm just a tool in God's hand. And I, I'm glad you mentioned this. The other day, I was uh, basically preaching. And I mentioned to, uh, uh, you know, the congregation that, uh, 
You remember the story of Paul. You remember the conversion of Paul. But how often do you remember Ananias, who was faithful to the calling of God, to go and speak to Paul the truth? We don't remember that, you know. Uh, so, indeed, there's a lot of Ananias out there that God used in a powerful way to bring the likes of, um, uh, you know, Spurgeon and the likes of uh, Billy Graham and the likes of... Uh, uh, Moody, uh, Dale Moody, and others. I mean, uh, we only think of these people, but we don't think of the faithful ones that witness to them so that they come to uh, faith in God and God is unleashing his power through their ministries. Amen. Yeah, and, and remember, Ananias was afraid at first. He had to overcome some fear. You want me to That's talk true. about that guy? That guy kills our people. That's All right, true. Lord, if you say it, I'll go. So, you know, he didn't. He did not go, but but he knew that it was, he was going into danger, and he did it anyway. Amen. When we, when we witnessed the Muslims, uh, depending right. on where you live, depending on who has access to you, it can be dangerous. Uh, right. Brother Al, one thing I want to do on this channel is not just tear down Islam, but build up Christianity and make it attractive to Muslims, among others. Can you tell us what kind of topics in, in, in relation to uh, the, the Christian faith would be good to uh, talk about for Muslims, things that they need to hear that they're not hearing in Islam. Um, so you're, you're talking about Muslims or the yeah, Christians? If I, if I make a show that, you know, people are, are uh, where it's, you know, from the Bible and we're teaching about Jesus, but in a way that will attract Muslims and, sure. and help them see there's something better out there. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, the first and foremost um, is that, uh, again, back again to sin and salvation, um, a Muslim is convinced that they do not need a savior. But you know what? We need to at least give Jesus a chance and come and listen to what Jesus can offer you. Um, that's one thing you can talk about. The, uh, the purpose of why Jesus came to earth in the first place, while Muslims acknowledge that he came to earth, there is a huge part of his story that is missing. I mean, he didn't come just to be a prophet or a messenger. He came to do much more than that. Um, even learning about who is the Holy Spirit in the scripture compared to what Muslims think. Why do we call God the Father? Because of our relationship with him. I mean, that's something that Islam or the Quran never teaches. There is a fatherly relationship here there is a family relationship when it comes to how god views me something that islam does not offer um you know just uh, just focusing on areas like this alone uh can present uh, truth to our muslim friends in a in a very powerful way and yet you're not really doing anything to for instance attack the teaching of the quran or attack islam you're offering Beyond, their, yes, they're zealots for God. Let me tell you that the God that you're zealot for, this is who he is. This is what he likes to be called. This is how he views you. He created you in his image and he cares for you. That's why he sent his son to die for you. Something that you'll never find, not just in the Quran, in any book on the face of this earth, that uh, any other God would have done for mankind other than the one that we worship. So, so these are the topics that I would say Muslims are uh, you know, might enjoy hearing about who God is as opposed to their own thoughts and ideas of who God should be. Great. Thank you for the suggestions. Uh, by the way, uh, some people in this in the live stream chat are thinking that you changed the name of your channel. <laughs> they said, is this Al Fadi's new channel? <laughs> we have to say, no, he's just a guest with us. I guess you don't do a lot of guest appearances, but... Uh, he hasn't changed the name of his channel. Go to Syria International <laughs> <laughs> as well, and us. Subscribe yeah. to both. <laughs> well, now that we have some of uh, my viewers, I encourage them to subscribe to this channel. Again, I, uh, either one of you, Scott or Jody, tell them how they, uh, what's the name of your channel and, uh, and so on and so forth, so they can uh, subscribe and even share it with others. Right. It's uh, the... Disciples of YHWH, it stands for Yahweh, Disciples of YHWH in Christ. Please subscribe because the main purpose of this ministry is to win souls for the kingdom, to win lost people dying and going to hell for the kingdom. I don't want to see nobody go to hell that doesn't have to because that would be a very bad place to go to. 
And, you know, we got Mormon friends. Uh, we got all kinds of friends who don't know the true Jesus. So I'm wanting to, you know, Islam teaches that Jesus is true, but they got the false to Jesus. Uh, you know, the LDS church, they teach a Jesus, but that's not the same Jesus I worship. So we got to have the true Jesus. So that's what our channel is about. Whether you agree or disagree, if you disagree, please uh, email us, disciples of YHWH at gmail.com, and we might give you a program or something But to uh, share your opinion. But the main thing is we're wanting to win souls, and especially Muslims. There's 1.8 billion, approximately, Muslims in the world. That's a lot of deceived people. And I love the passion of Muslims. I love how they love their faith and they're willing to die for their faith. But you know what? Christ died for me so that I didn't have to die for my faith. And I think that's a big difference. And uh, so uh, keep us in your prayers. Amen. Well said, Jody. I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, Brother Al Fadi, we know you're a busy guy. We thank you for taking the time out to come and visit us. And thank you for giving us our channel some exposure, especially when we were just starting out and you're again welcome. now, and, and for sharing all your knowledge. And it's a, it's a great ministry you have. We thank you for that work as well. And, you know, again, uh, please subscribe. Thanks all for coming out and watching us. And uh, I'll let uh, uh, doc, uh, Brother Al, you should have uh, a last word, and then Jody, go ahead. Well, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. I encourage uh, many of who are watching it now or watch, uh, will be watching this later to please uh, consider at least subscribing to this channel. Uh, there is a lot of guests that they have interviewed, a lot of great guests, to be honest with you, some that I would love to even have on my channel. So, um, you know, try, try not to focus on the channel, focus on the content that a channel can offer you. And I think you'll be blessed through this. And again, thank you guys for inviting me. And I hope uh, we can do more uh, work on this and we can uh, coordinate and organize uh, some thoughts and ideas and topics. And uh, maybe next time I'll have even a slideshow to uh, show certain things uh, that we discovered um, recently, whether it's corrections or uh, archaeological evidence and so on and so forth. All right. Well, God bless you. Appreciate you coming on our show. You're a great man of God. We really were praying for you. And I know prayers, you know, I can't be there with you physically, but prayers change things. I talked to my atheist friends. I had an atheist friend to cut me off from Facebook. Well, that's okay. You know, you're going to get enemies in this business if you're preaching the truth. But you know what? There's one thing my atheist friend who uh, block me, can't do. He can't stop the prayers of to Jesus. He can't stop work. You know, he can't stop that because God is more powerful than either one of us. So please subscribe, Disciples of YHWH and Christ. Also look us up on Facebook, uh, Jody Roger Bishop or Scott Walton. And uh, God bless you. And we, we appreciate everyone that uh, came to join us today. And goodbye.